The title is Dixie Scenes in Poetry from Virginia to Louisiana, but I can't cover every state in between. I was not born in Dixie. I came originally from Colorado. I was born there and both my parents were born there. But the mountain and desert west, excluding what lies west of the Sierra Nevada, have much in common, concern for tradition, for the land, an independent spirit, and many, many common dislikes. I addition, additionally, I note for you my long residence in the South. Except for 14 of my first 15 years, I have lived in a Confederate state, except for time spent abroad. Uh, one of my great-grandfathers was born in 1799, this is a great-grandfather, not great-great, in the state of Virginia. And my mother's maternal family lived from that time on in the south or in border states. My paternal grandmother, born a subject of Queen Victoria and never renouncing her allegiance to the British monarch, supported the south in all matters. Lastly, I've been certified by Clyde Wilson. <laughs> uh, the poem, most of the poems I shall read will be in uh, uh, order by state, that is by setting, not chronological order of publication. So I'll start with Ash Lawn, that's James Monroe's house in Virginia. This comes from Journeying from Canyon to Shea, 1977. December, where a cold sun glazed the snow and left the lanes to ice, Ash Lawn waits out another year. It lasts unrestored, uncluttered by costumed ladies, craftsmen in buckled shoes selling tourist wares. A single housekeeper is nearly idle, leading no one else through the narrow rooms of Monroe's house or his more ample mind, reflected by trees opening on a prospect of hills. In this late time, what is left? Without fires burning, sheets under the counterpane, there is no reality in the beds, no virtue in the sideboard terrines. Nothing lives except intruder's breath and outside the boxwood slow, seasonless green. Might not one remain at home, warmer, and know just as well there the loneliness of things abandoned? To hear an echo of oneself or survive among designs outlived, one should not need history. What brings us here is worse, not architectural grace, beauty of ornament or line, nor the incidental picturesque that makes us say, well, this is different, but death, keener, finer than in our own mirror. In spring, years later, I still look back on it, not touching bottom anywhere. The next poem is from the same collection, Journeying from Canyon to Shea. It's called Liberty Furnace. The word furnace here indicates an iron ore operation that is mine and forge dating from the 1820s in Shenandoah County, Virginia. It is much better known now, I dare say, than when I visited it with a friend in the 1960s. The poem is a very moral poem. All poetry should basically be moral. For the betterment of mankind, presumably not its worsening, in this case, the name of the forge and the question by which the poem ends provide an explicit perspective on what are called values. Liberty Furnace. Yes, we had thought about it before, 
narrow lives back in those hollows, faces born to plain rail fences, a web of years, white with love's moons, the snows, the buried child, then all become twice past in a rush of vines and vindicated ash that greened even death. Reaching the cul-de-sac, dropped between cat's cradle ribs, one came into exile, met wildness riding down the pits, endured its roar, a struggling of winds, an animal gasp, unless it were ghosts who cried from the ridge's throat. But this hardness was liberty, or so they named the forge, and the streams ran red for a hundred years with Allegheny iron and a hammered strength until the weathercock hung askew, pointing toward loss, all loss. What wounds autumn now leaves on these hills, which no mill can wash? Flames leap down from the sun, the brick turns incandescent, and fire burns again to refine our late indifference before our bones shall blanch like theirs below the willows. Not that we should ever make our bread, our staves from this soil, but ask the question always, can we live more freely with their iron in our heart this side of their peace. The next poem comes from my first collection, Watering, University of Georgia Press, 1972. Um, in this book, in, which I don't, of which I don't have a copy, I couldn't bring them all with me, many poems have southern settings. This is called Camden House. It's a real location, historic location in Virginia. This poem is, is a bit long, and since you must hear it without being able to read it at this point, at least, I will tell you in advance what the reader who finds out with his eye uh, discovers, that the first part is a dream. The I who is speaking is recounting her dream. And then it goes on to the, to what is the, the, the waking reality. Camden House. I am standing in the kitchen, my hair in braids around my head. Iron and copper pots hang above the wood range, and a low window looks out to the river, which I know as if it were my blood. He is wearing a sword and a gray cavalry costume. And though he does not speak, I know that the sergeant is waiting and that he leaves for another war, which I had only read about and now relives for me. A presentiment of disaster must haunt him, for he will not go. He paces to the door, a glove slaps, and I grow embarrassed as the moment swells, floods, passes. Later, I am alone in the drawing room under yellow Italian curtains whose huge flowers mingle in pat patterns incomprehensible. It is quiet and I do not breathe. Then the fulfillment comes, ever following quickly in dreams upon fear or hope, the shots blast. I awoke. So Camden, named for a lord, got its tower blown off by a federal gunboat shooting blind at the head of the south. It came around the bend where the Rappahannock crooks under steep banks had to follow the channel along the bluff. The gunners could see only the corbelled eaves of the villa. They shot for target practice. She was alone in the house then with the servants and slaves. She saw the cuts where the lowest shots lodged in the timbers of her wedding chamber, walked among the debris in the garden. It was calm afterwards. No peace endures. He had built this across the river from her birthplace to woo her over. A Baltimore architect had come to oversee the building, 
the blueprints hung framed in the hall. Three years later, he was a colonel in a dissident army. She was 22. Before the gunboat came, he had bidden her goodbye. Under the Lee and Carter portraits, he had let her hear, not of present necessity, but of a future, the house that was his love for her, and of the long elm lanes he would plant, where they would pass and their children later. Then he walked to the boxwood hedge where his horse waited. Two-minded South, two-faced, honor and slavery, white and black. Some still live the wound of it. I walk along the alleys which a descendant trims on his power mower. All has once again been called into question. I move among the columns of Camden's endurance and think of what the defeated men must have felt rocking on the porch of the Richmond old soldier's home. Something died at Camden, but something else was dreamt love laying the pink stones. We are its waking, time's blueprints bred in bones. I'll read now the poem, Watering, which gives its title to the collection, Watering. I taught at the University of Florida for three years, hence I've got a little Florida connection. On the edge of our rise, looking outward to the ocean, oleanders and poinsettias stand in shallow pits threaded along the afternoon fence. From one dirt basin to another, I pull the green ribbon of the hose, letting a silver thread splash the dust. Then, still spinning, seek lanes and hollows, wring the roots and rouse the dark powder. Then, with a rush and a deeper gurgling, encircle high the center clump, making islands and pools, first muddied, finally clearing enough to be blue. Down the row, the hose and I move slowly, waiting each time for the water to rise to the brim, while the long yellow rays turn the brown circles behind us to opal. When the last trench tastes the spray on its lip, and the gray stems have grown moist up to the first leaves, I look back to the chain of pools and droplets where a little labor has taken root in living things. A gust comes up from the sea to whip the diked water which quivers eagerly, and I see how the gardener, guessing at some dark thirst, the wind with sea thoughts, writes the rings of his own desire upon the earth. The next poem from the same collection is called Carnival of Turtles. There were turtle researchers at the University of Florida. This is a fanciful poem, not one really about scientific research. Carnival of Turtles. See the balloons blowing out to sea. The great turtles have crawled onto the beach, laid their eggs under a full moon, and sprawled inert from exhaustion. Across the dunes come the turtle men from the university. Mark a dozen shells and attach balloons, which rise like Montgolfiers. Now, swimming with the tide, the turtles must ride the surface and for miles they will be seen, set against the gray, by impartial eyes, mapping the current's pull and their mysterious roots. But to follow them farther after science is satisfied would tr be truly to do turtles praise. <coughs> then guillemots and albatross will spy globes off the aisles, red, blue, canary yellow. Fishes will rise from the waves. Dolphins will jump alongside in a merry-go-round of green to celebrate the carnival at sea. Weary moths blown out too far can pause, their wings quivering from surprise on the smooth crest of the balloons 
which send their signals by crosswinds and bob free, blooming on the waves for all eternity and tracing their ways for the great lover of turtles. The next uh, two poems come from Michael. I didn't write it up because it doesn't have any difficult words in it. Places in Mind, LSU Press 2000. Uh, oh, I did write the word crew, K-R-E-W-E, -E, an fanciful spelling of crew or group or club. Those are the Mardi Gras clubs in New Orleans. And three or four of the Mardi Gras crews are mentioned in this poem. Exultate, I should say. The title comes from Exultate Jubilate of Mozart. Exultate. Horses high is on the Assyrian gates, cruciform flambeau and the dancing feet of black men swaggering with them, the navy steel band in its shrimp boat set on wheels, then floats, more marchers, music. This is carnival again. Night after night, the revelry, Babylon, Hermes, Bacchus, bards of Bohemia. The drumbeat rises to my windows, shakes a vase of tulips and my nerves, pounding through the purity of exultate jubilate on the radio, which a few souls, esthetes, or just misanthropes prefer, must, one must assume, to Mardi Gras. My old vinyl version was with Matawilda Dobbs, who did her Mozart in a voice of clearest summer light against the dark lamenting of her people's memory. The man who gave me that recording now is dead. Washing the past from my eyes or trying to, I hear another marching band and the calliope with Rex's song, If Ever I Cease to Love. I walk out to the balcony above the steady tenor of the crowd and watch the flask floats pass, the paddy wagon, and the stragglers scavenging the beads, doubloons, and tinsel. Stars play out to heaven's edge. In my mind, the music starts again. Beyond, the angels weep in ecstasy to hear the alleluias, wiping with their wings their dazzling tears. And from, I trust I can find it, zoot, zoot, zoot. from the same collection, the Jesus of Magazine Street. Now, two or three of you have heard me read this perhaps twice, at least once. Uh, I, I uh, take the liberty of rereading it. Uh, audiences generally like it. Magazine Street's a long, long street, goes through from, from uh, Canal Street through the Irish Channel and uptown and so on. I lived very close. Uh, the the uh, setting, of the, the uh, seasonal setting of this poem is Easter tide, more or less the Easter season. And uh, this recounts how I drive over to a, a, a lamp shop on Magazine Street uh, to get my lamp repaired. The shop is closed when I arrive. We get there too early. But moreover, I discovered that my Jeep has a completely deflated, I've driven on a deflated tire. So I got two problems. The Jesus of Magazine Street. Because a shop called Shades of Light is closed, here I am in April loitering on the stoop of Jewels, a Palestinian grocery, and listening idly to the Jesus of Magazine Street while my broken lamp stands on the sidewalk, and even my Jeep is a derelict, having hobbled this way with a deflated tire. Waiting for a man to come round with a jack and the shop to open, I drink coffee with the grocer, who explains that the fellow shouting there, deranged a bit, is not dangerous, just asks for a cigarette 
now and then, but unlike Christ at Cana, he appears to leave wine alone, which is doubtless a fortunate thing, and preaches to all who pass by. I am the Jesus of Magazine Street. Repent, repent. When the last trumpet sounds, oh yes, I'll be up there, he points. Up there, white man, where will you be? The grocer observes to me, tapping his own, that a fuse is blown in the fellow's head. But that he cannot blame him, thanking God instead that he himself is rational. Perhaps he thinks of Palestine, the Hebron Valley, Galilee, of one who cried repentance in the wild and its most famous son, who for a while prayed out in the desert with the birds under the olive trees and then returned, illumined, cleansed, and filled with holy words, which he distributed like loaves along the roads and by the lake until he was betrayed, his radiant godliness rewarded by a crucifying mob. Here, at least, the fellow is unharmed, although disciples few. The Easter sunlight shines on shards of glass and the oil-stained shoes of the prophet, walking the road of madness to the deserted mountaintop. This poem is called Hats, a Portrait. It comes from my 2011 collection under the Pericola, LSU Press. The setting is authentic, but the character and her, the scenario are invented, but they are very true to what might be the case. Hats, a Portrait. She lives alone still in her New Orleans relic of a house on Esplanade, among objets d'art and hats, perched in a hall tree. Crazy D, the neighbors call her, behind her back. Not daft, though, merely out of style. Her ways were fashionable once. Privacy, good taste, proprieties, and lasting love, along with hats and gloves, high heels and stockings, shopping on Canal Street, Latin mass at the cathedral, bridge and luncheons. Now her love, her friends are dead. No children, just a nephew, covetous. The Latin mass was ended by the Vatican. Canal Street is for tourists, and she can't wear high-heeled shoes or pull those awful pantyhose on stiffened limbs. But hats endure, and gloves. In a chest of drawers, she leafs through stacks, long glazed ivory kidskin gloves for balls, fur-lined gloves for winter, pigskin honey-toned for races at the fairgrounds, Cotton summer gloves, all yellowed. Fishnet for a costume ball. Ah, yes, that night. Venetian mask, Elizabethan collar, fur, and waist of 22. A pair of gloves in hand, she walks by little bird steps to the beveled window and the millinery tree. Returning from the honeymoon with Jacques that year, the days when people crossed by ship with boxes, trunks, and portmanteau, she brought from Paris 15 hats. She chooses one, a gray fedora, stylish as a 40s film, and tries it, thinking of the honeymoon again. Another in blue straw, with a little turned-up brim and pheasant feathers angled jauntily. And this, a favorite, a darling Hamburg, of a luscious black velour and grow grain trimmed. She'll not go out today, too cool with impish lake gusts, whipping trees and rattling shutters. But there's nothing wrong with make-believe. 
She dons the Hamburg, adds a bit of veiling, found by chance, to anchor it against imaginary wind, draws on the glove, gloves, and wraps around her throat an ostrich feather boa from the parlor cabinet. Voila. She, she checks the mirror, marred like her by age spots, judges the effect. A little later, might she even stroll a moment on her gallery with oaks and oleanders as the surrogates of friends? A superannuated fashion show and Jacques' devoted shade returning as in dream? But now the tears have come again. Perhaps she t should not try it after all. S since people stare and meddle and might report her to the nephew, say she's lost her memory, when memory is all she has. The hat's hung up, the gloves and boa cast aside. A shaft of slanting light reminds her of a crimson sun at sea. The ship's wake gleaming. Time's a room where dust motes swirl and sparkle in the sun, then disappear. The mansion creaks and lists into the evening. Shivering, she rises, draws the curtains, going down in waves of dark. Some of you have heard this poem before. Likewise, everybody who was here last year and people who were at Union and people who were at Natchitoches. I think I read that they, they say, I really don't know. This poem is called Carolina. It's set in South Carolina. I can't leave it without getting it read this afternoon. This is an iambic pentameter. I'm interested in form. You might not know it, but I'm greatly interested in form. There's just no time to talk about that. Uh, the Carolina is the title, and there's a, a little uh, epigraph which says, South Carolina, 1875. The speaker is a woman of years. Uh, and I can, I, uh, the, the, the word Saint-Domingue, uh, the name Saint-Domingue is, is uh, used in the first stanza, that's Santo Domingo, the island that now has on it the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And it belonged to the French at the time, and as you will hear, it was the years of the rebellion of Toussaint Louverture against the French. Not the 1875, her childhood, which she refers to. They found us drifting in the sea along the coast. The rations almost gone, the three of us half crazy from the wind and sun. The boat a little leaky, but afloat. From Saint-Domingue, the currents had been strong, the weather fair. We had been carried up past Charleston, we were told. I don't recall the journey well, you know. At five, bereft of how much I did not realize then of both my parents, sailing empty seas with Lou, our old negress, and Georges, my brother. She had learned, it was the years of those revolts of Haitians under Toussaint Louverture, that all the servants and the slaves, herself included, were to rise against the French that week and slaughter everyone. She would not do it to us, children she had nursed and loved, and yet she could not speak against her people. She had thought to take us out, a boating party, so she said. She'd heard of islands thick with traveler's palm, where birds refreshed themselves in flight. We left the sails like angels' wings. She'd managed to purloin a few supplies, fresh water most of all, some food, some sheets. We lived on coconuts, I think, and sugar toward the last. She may have had some rum. She sang to us at night her Creole lullabies. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm the coffer. 
When we were saved, she told her story in our broken French. The strange thing is it was some French who found us, Huguenots. And stranger still, my name is Caroline, as if somehow by providence my mother had foreseen our odyssey. Now Lou Goodwoman lies in Carolina ground. We had, of course, no photographs. My parents' smiles became a phosphorescent sea, translucent, dark, untouchable, a ghostly imago receding in the waves. Yet now they seem like children, younger than my own. They walk beneath the palm trees in my dreams and laugh, the trade wind scattering perfume, or sit at sunset holding hands and speak of France and golden journeys. Look, the tide is high. Sargasso shines in jeweled light. At dusk, I listen to the birds that wheel and dive and watch the stars grow powdery and dense and sometimes think I hear a song, a shout, two shadows calling on a distant shore. Thank you. These poems are not set in the South. They are about Christian saints and martyrs. But uh, I should read only two of an eight poem series that closes my book. Uh, and since the, one of them and the last of the entire book is St. Christopher, I think perhaps it belongs in this company. Do you agree? So these are short rhymed poems, three stanzas, three, three quatrains each, iambic pictometer rhymed. And they are based on a, a book of hours that, that was made for Catherine de Cleve, uh, who became a Duchess of Gilders when she married a, a, a fellow in the Lowlands. Uh, this is a fine book, the manuscripts in the J. Pierpont Morgan uh, library in New York City. So I, I shall read the, the first and the last. They, they, they require no further comment, I, I hope. Conversion of St. Hubert. Astride a handsome dove gray, long-limbed horse, a rider richly capped and dressed with art, stops suddenly, arrested in his course, bewildered by a wondrous rearing heart. The reins are stretched and taut, the steed pulls back. The holy stag, its forelegs crossed, displays a crucifix encircled in its rack. A hunting dog, its paws together, prays. The halo is already done, its gold contrasting with the hunter's smart attire. The future and the past, the new, the old, to Christ are all one moment, spark, flame, fire. St. Christopher carrying the infant Christ. It's richly drawn, a multi-action scene. The infant on his shoulder holds a globe and blesses Christopher, whose mantle, green, drags underfoot, his cut-off scarlet robe may be in tatters. At the lower edge, the gates of Gaza fall, a parallel. The saint is weary. On a rocky ledge, a hermit lifts a lantern. Wavelets swell. As orange sunset fades before the night, the saint leans on his staff, as if he bore a growing stone. The moon is high to light the shallows, and the bearer steps ashore. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer questions.